So welcome to another edition of the Brazilian Shirt Name Podcast. Um, the Legend Dino is here, and Tim, we are looking at one of the most sorrowful days um, or evenings of the England national football team. Um, it goes down in history, this one, doesn't it? Yeah, but so often, obviously, with our English obsession, it's seen from the England side yeah. and not from the other side, for yeah. whom it's one of oh, their all-time great days. And we have today to help us tell this story we have the son of a deity oh really you yes. don't mean Elias Torsen that's you? exactly who I mean Elias Torsen Icelandic journalist welcome to the Brazilian shirt name uh, thank you so much you were in the stadium on a historic day um, when Iceland beat England yeah let me say it again folks <laughs> With all due respect, Iceland beat England on the 27th of June 2016 in the Euros. It was a Viking ting, I think it's fair to say, Elias. Uh, you must have been enjoying, well, you probably didn't enjoy the first few minutes, but then after that, you, you were dancing in Icelandic jig uh, written by the Sugar Babes, I'm sure. Well, I mean, Sorry. I. Uh, wrong group. It wasn't the Sugar Babes, was it? Sugar <laughs> Tubes is from Iceland. Sugar Babes is from the UK. I know. Apologies. <laughs> I'll take that back. Um, yeah, definitely is uh, the Sugar Cubes. But yeah, tell us about it. Tell us about that day. Well, I mean, you, you call it historic, and it definitely is. But I would refer it to, and I think most Icelanders to, as the best day of my life. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, wow. you would, wouldn't you? Wow. And, and, and how do you really put it into words? Like delirium, ecstasy, uh, togetherness. It was just insane. Like, and I mean, I actually I wasn't supposed to go to the game. I was a recent graduate living in Copenhagen, actually. And my best friend rang me up and said, Elias, I got two tickets to Iceland, England. We're going to Nice. So I was like, holy, I don't have any money. What do I do? So I rang my bank up and said, I need 2,500 euros to go to a football game. <laughs> and for whatever reason, I got the money and, and I'm off. And it was just, I mean, obviously, the atmosphere around the whole team, you know, coming into the England game was just amazing. Like there, there was something, I don't know, like 10% of the nation was in France. <laughs> you know, mm. it was like, I, I mean, it was something That's insane. 30,000 people, yeah? 30,000 yeah, yeah. people. 30,000 yeah, 30, Icelanders <laughs> were... In, th this makes it even worse, Tim, the fact that we, a nation of 60 summit million, got beat by a nation of 330,000. Well, it, it is, obviously. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. But I had read a very fine book called Soconomics, and uh, uh, there have been a number of issues, a number of... through the years... The one I've got came out, I think, in 13, 2013. And one of the points it makes is, look out for Iceland. It kind of predicts it in a way because it's saying the, 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 it's, it's a very data-driven book. It's right on many things. It's wrong on some. But uh, it, it's looking at the Icelandic obsession with football. Uh, you know, we've, we've just heard there the percentage of the population who were there in France. But the percentage of the population who are interested in football, uh, growing up watching Engl uh, games from, from English football, is a huge percentage involved. And the book says, from the 90s, they invest heavily in facilities. There's a lot of people playing the game as well, a massively high um, percentage of playing the game, especially when they've got facilities that they can use all year round because the, the season for Icelandic football is very short as a, as, as a, as a consequence yeah. of, of the weather. So th this, uh, Elias, is a thing that, all right, it's a, it's a surprise result, unbelievable result, but one that doesn't happen just by chance, something no. that Iceland have been building to for a while. Yeah, and I mean, I mean, obviously you need luck when you're that few, but I mean, when it comes down to it, it's 11 against 11, right? So anyone can beat anyone, on, you know, possibly. Uh, but the facilities, yes, I think that's a key issue. And I mean, growing up, I played football myself growing up. And I mean, the conditions were terrible. Like I'm born in 88. Like you were playing on gravel 
throughout winter, right? You got like three months of playing on grass. But this generation, the 2016 team, I mean, the majority, like our key players, they are a couple of years younger than me. And they are coming through the youth academies when we have these indoor stadiums where you can play year round. So I think it's no coincidence that this is the first generation of like where we have had an actual team. Like we've had outstanding individuals. Like, I mean, obviously you must be, a, I mean, aware of Eder Gudjonsson who played for Chelsea and Barcelona. By the way, fun fact about him, uh, the Icelandic national team did not win a game for seven years when he was not playing. Wow. That, that was the state of the team, you know, before that well, current. Going, that going current. before that, as a, as a Tottenham fan, I remember, and I apologize for my pronunciation, Gudni Bergson. Yeah, who, yeah, yeah. Uh, who was a very, very good right back. He was a, he was a quick right back, good player. Mm -hmm. so also, there, there was some talent there. Mm -hmm. But as you say, once the facilities are in place, it becomes much easier to produce. Yeah, because I mean, you, you, you know, you can't run a team on one or two stars. Like you need a whole team and you need an actual, and, and I mean, what we should not forget is also just what Lars Lagerbeck, the, the, the manager at the time brought to the team. Because I mean, he brought, I mean, and I, I remember I was, I was discussing this. I mean, obviously, you know, the famous commentator, Gumi Ben, who, who became like a meme for his shouting, uh, you know, Oof. commentary <laughs> in the games of the Euros. <laughs> And I remember I was doing an interview with him once and, and he and he was talking about this because, I mean, I, I mean, I, I like, you know, the narrative often around that Icelandic team, the 2016 team is like, oh, there's like, oh, the assistant manager or the co-manager. He's a part time dentist. and da, da, da. But I mean, these players were professional footballers. I mean, not all of them are playing like in, you know, superstar teams. But I mean, they're no, playing there's, in the there's, there's one of them playing for a rabble called Charlton Athletic. Yeah, once yeah, upon yeah. a time, yes, once <laughs> upon a time, you're absolutely yeah. right. No, we've done good business with Icelandic <laughs> players. In fact, if you think about it, Icelandic players started coming into the English leagues, what, in the 1980s, you know, in on mass, as it were. Were they Am going I to right? Scotland? Were they going to Scotland before that? Was Scotland a kind of way in? I, I, I'm not sure. But, I mean, the, the first professional footballer Iceland had was actually the... He was the grandfather of Albert Guðmundsson, who is our best player at the moment. And it was his namesake. And he actually signed for Arsenal in the, I want to say, like the late 50s. Uh -huh. So I think he was our uh -huh. first professional footballer. Right. Um, and the ideal thing for our leagues <clears throat> in Great Britain for Icelandic players was that they could play in their own leagues and in our leagues because of the... Um, the league schedules. Am I right in that? That your your league plays mostly in the summer, in the warmer months, whereas our league takes a break in those months so they can play in both leagues. Was that an exaggeration? I mean, the league here, it's it's been extended a bit in recent years. Uh, I think also because, I mean, we have more AstroTurf pitches, but now it runs from, I think, late April to October. It used to be more, you know, May to September. But I mean, that's oh. the normal kind of football calendar. So yeah. looking, looking at the, the the team, and they're they're all obviously they're all they're all based abroad. There's you know there's some in 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 England, in uh, Germany, France, mm -hmm. Sweden, and you mentioned the assistant coach or the co coach <laughs> Lars Lagerbeck, who's mm -hmm. obviously vastly experienced from from Sweden. Yeah. And th that was actually my point. This is what Gummi Ben was talking about. Is that so? All these players, I mean, they're used to high professionalism from the, the the backroom staff as well and i think what lars lagerberg brings is that kind of quality to the backroom staff and you know and a manager that they can you know i don't want to i'm not denigrating anyone who came before him but you know you know he's a respected guy from where yeah. he has like done things you know he's not a not an icelandic manager you know he hasn't been managing in the local leagues here he's like it's a proper professional, you know, and I think that degree of professionalism is, is shows in the Euros in 2016. And I mean, don't forget, like we were that close to qualifying for the 2014 World Cup. Like yeah. we lost out in playoffs against Croatia. So it, it wasn't just like the Euros was where it, it all came together, like suddenly and, and, <clears throat> and unexpectedly. Like there has been a build up to the Euros. And I mean, and I mean, we came out of a really 
interesting, fun qualifying uh, group as well. Like we beat the Netherlands home and away. I mean, that game in Amsterdam, like I never bet on football, but before the game, I was like, we're winning. Like I, I could feel it. And, and so, I mean, we qualified on like the Euros have been expanded in 2016, but we qualified even yeah. Before yeah. the expansion, that, so, that, that was that was often brought up, wasn't it? Oh, Iceland are only here because the t- it's the t- <laughs> first time it's been expanded, yeah. and it wasn't true, was it? No, no. we qualified. Uh, we would have qualified even if they hadn't expanded the, the tournament. What were the, the strengths of of that team, and why were you so optimistic that they could win away to Holland? What did this team have? I mean, I, I think at the time it's just belief and momentum, right? I mean, you have that. But you could tell that, I mean, these are like, you, you know, you go to these cliches when you're thinking about these things, like togetherness, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. blah, blah, blah. But I mean, I, I think it was, a, it was a disciplined team. It had enough quality in it. Like you had like players like Gilvis Heus and Johan Berg. And I mean, uh, <clears throat> so, I mean, you you have quality players mixed with really solid individuals you know and i and i think like they were all willing they believed in the project themselves and 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 then they got a couple of good results and the ball kind of just went rolling and it just kind of snowballed from there so i think when we come into the game against holland which was if i remember correctly was like we had three games after the 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 games against the game against holland like you you just believed like we had beaten them at home we we started the qualifying group by beating turkey three nil like it was just you could feel there was something in the air you know mm. when you feel that, at all, go on go on Don. no i was going to say when you feel that as a football fan mm-hmm. um i believe that it transfers on the pitch as well you mentioned the support from iceland uh, mm-hmm. could you feel some of that support or that belief being transferred oh, yeah. onto the pitch and to the players I, I, I definitely believe it. <clears throat> and I mean, this is also another interesting thing that starts happening around, I think, like 2014, maybe a bit earlier. So growing up, I went to a lot of uh, national team games with my foster father back in the day. And it was miserable. It was dreary. I mean, it's always kind of cold. <laughs> like we, this is before we even expanded the stadium. So you have like a 5,000 seat capacity stadium nobody's interested in the team because we're always really bad and you're sitting there watching us lose to latvia and it's just terrible <laughs> but then around 2014 what happens is that tolvan which just means basically the 12th man which is the official supporters group starts to form and becomes really really active and strong like obviously you're all aware of that viking yeah, yeah, yes yeah. yes like, yes that kind of comes from those guys and they are the guys with the drums and keeping up the mood and that just improved the atmosphere in the stadium so Mm -hmm. much and i mean that's what they took with them to france and russia and whatnot and i mean i think definitely you know all these things come have to come together for for (laughs) such a small nation to achieve anything in a team sport like you need to have almost like a perfect storm of things i don't suppose suppose you could just do that clap for us. Um, <laughs> oh, my, no. one man oh, clap. No, no, no. no. Please don't make just, you do that. Yeah, okay. No, no, no. You, you, you don't have to do that. But honestly, <laughs> when you hear that, you know yeah. that Iceland's on a roll. They're not playing. They're not They're not coming just to have a good day out. Um, yeah. Go, go, you go ahead, Tim. You've been trying to come in. I've got one question about the quality of the England side, but maybe that can wait for a moment. No, I mean, so, so I mean, I would love to talk about like I watch more English football than Icelandic football, and I think that goes for most Icelanders. Like we started getting live broadcast from English football in the late '60s, and so I mean, in a sense, you created the 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 team that beat you at the Euros because the Premier League is huge here. Like, if you follow football at all, the question you will ask somebody usually when you start a new a new job or whatever you go so who do you support in the premiership like that's yeah. what, that's what the, 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 this is a point that the, the soconomics book was making years <laughs> before it was saying everyone is 88 percent of the icelandic population have can identify a favorite english team so this is a case of english football creating a monster it's it's dr frankenstein's son 
yeah. And I mean, and, and you know, and and that's why I mean, the game against England, it, it was really special. Like, I mean, in a sense, the game against Austria, the last uh, group stage match, was a way more interesting game. You know, in terms of the football, like we score, we Austria misses a penalty, and we score with the last kick of the ball. We score a goal, two one, win the game, right? So I mean, that was a, a thrilling game. The England game is bigger. Okay, I mean, it's a knockout stage, so which makes it bigger. But I think to Icelanders, it's not that we see as a rivalry towards England, but we watch these English players week in, week out. Like we know them. So beating England, it it it, it has a extra level of importance to 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 Icelandic football fans at least yeah there's so, a couple of, go no on, no go he, well I, I was going to say um as as delirious as you were by the time this game <laughs> ends let's talk about yeah. what you thought about when you saw not just the England team that was rocking up for this but also you know the the manager who's going to um, resign from his post after this match because he knows but a, it's a big up. man in Scandinavia, isn't he? So huge, uh, huge in Scandinavia. Yeah. Once upon a time, of course, in Sweden specifically. Um, what did you think? Did you think? Did you have the belief that Iceland was going to beat this particular England team? Was there a weakness there? Did you think they were there for the taking? I mean. Yes, I, I did. I, I did. Uh, I did Based before on the match. Based on what? Just, just like I said, I mean, I, I remember that England team being just kind of, I guess the word I would think was just uninspiring, I think would be the, the, the term I would use about the team. Like a lot of good players, like Harry Kane coming off a really, really strong season. But then I remember, like, like why is he playing Jack Wilshire? The man hasn't played a minute of football for twelve months, mm. and and it was just like these decisions. Mm. And obviously, being a huge Manchester United fan, like I, I never believed in mm. having Chris Smalling in defense. And as it showed, it was the second Icelandic goal. Like he was completely at fault. Well, he and mm. Joe Hart clearly. So, and I mean, Roy Hodgson is he, not a very sexy manager. It's it's just kind of I don't know. I, I I don't know. It's just like. We came come off the Austria game. We didn't lose a game in the in the in the group stages. Got a one-one draw against Portugal. Like you could just feel there was something in the you know in the air that mm. that that the wind was blowing with us, so to speak. You know, but I can tell you, I have a really funny anecdote about that game. So the day before, me and my mate, we go to to the to the mats. We're sitting at this typical French cafe out in the sun, and on the t- table next to us are these two really really elderly gentlemen and they were like around 90 and they were brothers and they were from england and like they're dressed like the movie stereotypical english gentlemen like all they're missing is just like world war ii medals on the front <laughs> <laughs> and, and we're chatting with these guys and, and 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 they're telling us that they're actually receiving a like a plaque or something from wayne rooney and roy hodson before the match against iceland being the officially the oldest england fans and and I mean they were they, they were at the game in '66 when England won the World Cup, and I mean the older brother he remembered very clearly the loss against the United States in 1950. <laughs> right? and, and I remember we and we asked them so if Iceland beats England tomorrow, where would that rank in like the pantheon of English football? <laughs> and they said the biggest humiliation in our history. And I think this is also a problem with maybe the mentality that the English players have coming into this. You know, they have everything to lose and very little to gain. Mm. Like they need to win and they need to win kind of convincingly. So while the pressure was really off of the Icelandic team, like they could have lost that game 4-0 and returned home heroes. No doubt. Uh, and, and I mean, and you see it, I think, in the game. Like, England gets that penalty. Like, Raheem Sterling goes down in the box. Wayne Rooney scores after, what, three minutes? And I remember we we're standing behind the Iceland goal, and I look at my friend and I say, oh, no. Is it going to be one of those games? But then, two, not two minutes later, goal on the other end. 
And I remember thinking, we are winning. Like, we responded immediately. Mm. I don't think, I mean, I think we're going to keep on going and we're winning the game. Did you, you have you a clear saw... view of, of, of that goal? Because you're oh, you're down the other end. Right behind the goal. I mean, it was kind of funny. The Icelandic fans, we got like 20% of the stadium, like this tiny corner. While the England fans were like 80%. <laughs> I thought that was a bit unfair, but whatever. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, I mean, I saw the goal. I, I saw the foul. Like, Hannes Halterson takes Raheem Sterling down. I saw Rooney score it. But then you see just like what happens in the England team. It's just like they just crumble. Like, I was never worried. Like, honestly, I can tell you. Like, and I don't think anyone in the stand was worried we were going to mm-hmm. lose the game, especially after the second goal. It just went, no, we got this. And I mean, in, in these desperate attempts, like, I remember that Harry Kane free kick from, like, I, I don't know how. It's like he's almost at the mid center line and he's taking a free kick trying to score. It was just so desperate and just sad. And, and and I don't understand, like the best player, I think the best England player in that game was Marcus Rashford and he played for <laughs> five minutes or something. <laughs> it was just, again, it just felt so uninspiring. Like half time, you're chasing a lead, put on Jack Wilshire. Like it, it, to me that nothing made any sense. No, I, I can I can see the sense behind it. I mean, he came on for Eric Dyer. Yeah. And uh, I mean, the, the, the two goals that England conceded, Defensively, they're really not very good, are they? And everyone no. knows that Iceland have this this long throw, flick on, man at the far post. Yeah. Uh, so th- they don't deal with that at all. I think it's Kyle Walker who loses who loses the scorer uh, Sigurdsson at, at, at the far at the far post. But they don't deal with the flick on it. And the second goal, you you blame Chris Smalling, but you can blame everyone. The two yeah. centre backs. You know, it's it's a lovely little move from mm-hmm. Iceland beautiful but the space that the 10 has that, that, that Sigurdsson has it, to receive the ball and play the little pass and mm-hmm. you're thinking well that's Eric Dyer no he, <laughs> he's supposed to be screening the centre centre backs he's not doing that job the two mm-hmm. centre backs are, are so passive and don't don't stop the shot which then squirms through Joe Hart so I can understand you're two one down thinking well Dyer hasn't done it defensively yeah. We'll bring on Wiltshire just to play. And he does play some reasonable balls mm. into the box. Yeah, I thought he was all right, actually. Yeah. Um, but then but, he, he starts but it, it was desperation well. stuff the, the whole yeah. the whole time. And I don't think Hodgson knew his team at any stage during the campaign. Yeah. 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 And I remember, like, uh, you know, you get a lot of, like, schadenfreude from this game. Like, <laughs> I watched every single clip I could find of Ang- English commentators talking about the game. And I mean, that's what they all said. Like, oh, I don't think he knew his team, blah, blah, blah. But I also don't think it helps the England team is you, you like the difference between how we view our national team in England always seemed to me to be very, very different. Like here, it's like, we don't want to talk badly about them. Like they're, they're Strauka Droger. They're our boys. Like that's how you tweet. Strauka Droger. Strauka Droger. Yeah. Strauka Droger. Yeah. Our boys is what that means. Yeah. But and you don't have like this press talking terribly about the team constantly and and and, and so in, and it always seems a bit you know from as an outside perspective a bit manic your relationship to the team like either you are the best in the world and you're gonna beat everyone or just like oh this is terrible fire everybody like you should never be on the pits instead of just you know enjoying the game and like you saw it with the England fans like they were so brazen before for the mats it was just like oh you know these horrible chat chauvinistic chants being shouted at us blah 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 and and then after the mats i mean fair play to them i mean they all walked up and said i mean you were better but you could they were booing their players like it was just mm-hmm. it was so just demoralizing for everyone i mean you lost the game but that, that also happens you know what i mean <laughs> Yeah, I don't think we're used to losing games to, with all due respect, the likes of Iceland. (laughs) I I genuinely feel, and, you know, from what you're saying, Elias, as well, that I genuinely feel that part of the problem is kind of what you've alluded to, the jingoism of uh, not just the England team, England supporters. You see, we don't know our European geography, and for yeah. us, Iceland may as well be Luxembourg 
which we beat very comfortably all the time. People forget about the Icelandic contributions uh, to the Premier League as it is now, the first division as it was before, going right up to the gentleman that you mentioned earlier on who you think signed for Arsenal in the late 1950s. Um, we've all had Icelanders in our teams. We've seen what they can do. Uh, particularly, in my view, uh, defensive midfielders, they're they are pretty solid, you know. Um, Everton has done really well um, out of it, um, as you know. Um, there'll be teams like, you, you mentioned Chelsea earlier on, but you know, they've had one Icelandic player who's shone through, but Everton have had about like four or five that have come through uh, there. Although they, you know, as Tim alluded to earlier on, they nicked one off us just in this... Um, <laughs> Euro summer that we're talking about. But I think we, as you mentioned earlier, we think of Iceland as being part-timers, which is what we would think of these other smaller nations. Well, that, the goalkeepers it, directing the films. Yeah. Granted, you can't well, take this seriously. Oh, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> but do you know, do you know, when we go sort of a goal down to any of the sort of minnows, panic. <laughs> Panic, crisis, humiliation, <laughs> panic, panic. panic. And that's, I remember that's, watching that's this. I, I watched this game. I, I watched this game. I, the, uh, I was in the the states for the cop. There was a Copa America happening in the in, in the states, so I, I don't remember very much about this tournament at all. I was busy with a with another tournament, but this one I had the morning off. So I, and Danny Rose and I was in New York. It's the only time I've ever been there. I was, and Danny Rose is playing, so I'm thinking, you know what? I've got I've got a I've got to go to Broadway. I've got to find a bar on Broadway so I can, you know, Broadway. Danny Rose. Yeah, yeah. Danny yes. Rose. Yeah. So, Broadway Danny Rose, yeah. So I have a little little wander around Central Park and then I find Broadway. And it takes me a while to find a bar that's showing the game. Uh, and But by the time it, it's already 1-1, you know, and I'm, so I'm picking it up. What? 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 We, we've, 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 we've let in a goal against this lot. Uh, and... Elias is absolutely not, right. Yeah. You never at any point believed in an England equaliser. Mm. You never thought it was going to happen. It looked like a, a, a bunch of players thinking, we're going to be... I've seen this happen to Brazil. Yeah. You know, well, you've seen it happen to England we're gonna be, as well. We're going to be humiliated. We're going to be humiliated. Let's yeah. find a whistle and let's run off the field as soon as possible and, for, and, and, and forget. It's the forget pot it. shots before that. Pot shots. Well, I mean, Wayne Rooney was skying them. Um, just from any position on the field. How worried were you, Elias, that maybe from somewhere England would manage to fluke a goal and save themselves and take it into extra time? I mean, I mean, maybe it's not logical, but I mean, standing in the stands, I was not worried at all, to tell you the truth. I, like I said, the Austria game was just nerve-wracking. Like the England game, I, I just felt comfortable. Like you're just having a lot of fun. Like you're just singing Party. and chanting. And, of course. You know, We've With all your... been there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so it was... on this occasion. And, and like I said, the whole mood around the stadium from the England side was just miserable. Like mm. ever since, like not even the second goal, just from the equalizer, you could just feel it kind of drop. Mm. Like I said, the England fans were like 80% of the stadium. Not a peep. Like you didn't hear anything it's... from them. This is until, real, they started, until they started booing. <laughs> this is a really good insight into what we should be wary of coming into the Euros this time around, though. Um, I don't think it's easy to change the culture of um, football fans, but like Tim says, when the crowd is on your back, oh, you know what the newspaper headlines are going to be the day after, it puts pressure on you at the time. You've got to perform at that time. And I think the danger is when England go down, go down um, letting a goal in the Euros, not least with the smaller teams in their group, for example, you know, which they should come through very easily. But there will you'll see panic at that point because there will there's always a doubt in England fans' minds about how far England or how good England really are against you know international opposition, how far they'll go. I think you will see exactly what you felt if we go down by a goal in our group stages. Definitely, but a, a lot of this, a lot of the story, I think, has to do with the unique pressures of tournament football. Because if this had been a group game, I think it would have panned out differently. 
the fact that, you, that w what tournaments do is suddenly from the group where almost everyone goes through, you know, uh, uh, in, for most of the groups, the three of the four teams qualify. So it's hard. It's hard to be eliminated in a group phase. And then suddenly you flick a switch and after 90 minutes or maybe 120 in penalties, one of these teams is, go is going home. And that, that puts a totally different psychological complexion on the game. But it's the same for everyone, though, isn't it? Yes, so it's indeed, indeed. Same. No, no. but as, as Elias has said, the pressure is on England to, to win big time. But then one of the things you have to do in tournament football is you have to deal with the euphoria. And you look at the next game, and before half-time, Iceland are losing 4-0 to France. Yeah. After beating England... Did you imagine we can go all the way now? No, 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 no. I, I never did. <laughs> and also you have... Yeah, to you're, you're lying to us here, right? No, you? no, no, I'm not. I'm not. Honestly, not. I mean, the France team was amazing. And and, and I mean, it's also, you got to remember, like, we have pretty good, pretty good team at the time, but our squad is tiny. Like, there's no rotations. Like, England rested, what, six players in their last group stage game? And we, we had to go it, like, not only that we needed to get results in our last game against Austria, but, I mean, they've been playing 90 minutes almost for for four games in a row. So you knew they were, they were knackered. I mean, and France just was, I mean, better. Like, I, I don't think, I haven't met anyone who was angry at the results against France. Never. Also because, like I said, I mean, we had achieved so much that anything on top of that would just be an added bonus. The, the 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 boys were coming home heroes, like the whole nation was just ecstatic. Like, I don't know if you watched like the clips from downtown Reykjavik. It's just pandemonium, and I mean, and every I think the viewership of the game against England was like ninety nine percent of the nation was watching. Like, I'm not joking. My grandmother, who has never watched a football game in her life, was watching. You know, that that's. Were, were you were you still there for the France game or your two, yeah. two and a half thousand euros? Did it only? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it was less than two. <laughs> but uh, no, sadly, I did not get tickets to the, to the, to the France game in Paris. I, I, I sadly only went to the, the game. So that, that's the difference. If, if you'd have been there, you'd have, you'd have made all the difference. No yeah, doubt. I guess. I guess. <laughs> and, and where does, because then Iceland reached the World Cup, which yeah. is bigger thing than the Euros. And the first game, you yeah. hold Argentina, mm -hmm. Lionel Messi, you hold them to a 1-1 draw. Yeah. Where does that stand in comparison with beating England? You're I saying mean, that for, for many Icelanders, beating England is the happiest day of your life. The draw I, with I Argentina, think, does it come close? I mean, it's huge. I mean, obviously, it's our first ever World Cup game. Right? We're the yeah. smallest nation to ever qualify for the World Cup, if, I, if, I'm, uh, if I'm correct. I think so. I mean, it's obviously it's huge, but I think the England game is <laughs> is bigger for me, but by 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 a by considerable distance. Uh, like I said, it's England, which is like we have a more connection to that than most of the Argentinian players. Even though I mean, it's obviously Lionel Messi and amazing footballers constantly in the Argentinian team. But I think the connection, the fact that it was a knockout stage game, and also you have to consider like this is our first ever tournament, like World Cup. Is our second tournament. I mean, still the World yeah. Cup, and it's huge. But it was just such a... Because, like I said, growing up, I never expected Iceland to ever qualify for anything. Mm -hmm. right? Because that's how it poor it was normally here. So just being able to qualify for the first time ever, and, and, and it seemed like something that shouldn't happen. You, you know what I mean? It just... It, it created such a, a, a unique and thrilling experience and atmosphere for every Icelandic fan. So, I mean, but the game against Argentina, I mean, clearly massive, massive. And then the less we talk about the, the other two games of the group, <laughs> you know, the better. <laughs> yeah, losing to a rabble like Nigeria. Yeah, that's not yeah. so... Can, can, it, can it ever get better than the England game? Is, is that... Have you experienced your peak? I mean, if we ever beat Denmark, I mean, that probably... <laughs> I, I, I hear there's a historian who is a massive football fan, and he he claims that no two national teams have ever played as many games against each other 
where one team has never <laughs> beaten. Oh. <laughs> I think it's something like 30 matches we played against Denmark. You know, obviously they're all colonial overlords. And I think that's some kind of mental block there. But I think beating Denmark, knocking out Denmark at a, at a at the Euros or the World Cup, I mean, that would probably beat England. I guess. <laughs> It would be like the West Indies beating England in cricket, wouldn't it, for the first time? <laughs> I, I didn't know that didn't I, this show just shows my ignorance about the area. I didn't know anything about this colonial relationship between Denmark, Denmark and Iceland. Denmark was the big colonialist in those days, yeah. you know. Um, funny enough, Sweden was as well, but Sweden tended to go east. So they went and colonised Russia, believe it or not. Tiny little mm. Sweden with the um, colonial masters in Russia. Carl the Twelfth of uh, Sweden or Charles the Twelfth of Sweden was a big, but Denmark went west or north west. First of all, Iceland, due to um, cultural links like Icelandic sagas, you know, Icelandic sagas are the template of all early um, Scandinavian literature, as it were, and. Yeah, so the Danes went to Iceland and they went to Greenland. So with Greenland, they went there in the one day. The one day when it was green. Yeah, yeah. yeah when it was green. <laughs> and in Iceland, they thought, we're not making that mistake. <laughs> So Obviously, the, the one thing for which Iceland also became famous just a few years before this was it seems betting the entire economy on 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 global toxic assets. Oh no! <laughs> yeah, I mean, has uh, which in in retrospect does look remarkably stupid. Uh, how much has that affected that that house of cards collapse? Has that affected Icelandic football to the extent that? We're not going to see generations for a while anyway, like this one again. I mean, the, the economy has completely recovered from the 2008 press. I, it was rough for, you know, some years. Uh, I think there was some weights deflation in the local leagues. I, I definitely put a halt to, you know, some investments. But, I mean, uh, it's been years since the economy recovered, recovered. So I don't think that has much bearing on anything that's happening at the moment, no. Of course, does, that, does that give extra ce celebration? For because I imagine 2016, you're still going through the process of of of, of recovery. Was that something extra for the celebration? Maybe, but it's not something I considered at the time. To be honest, it was just it was just about the football and and you know qualifying and and being together. And I mean, and also because we're such a small country, it's it's just amazing. Like you go to Nice. And I remember, like, one of the first things I did was I snuck into a picture being taken off the president, you know. <laughs> and, and then, you know, and then I'm outside the stadium and I meet my, my, my cousin, you know. It, and it was just like this, you know, family atmosphere with all the kind of top politicians and, and famous people of Iceland, you know. And, and, and that, because that's what it is to be coming, coming from such a small place. So it was just about that. I don't think the financial crash played much of a role, at least not for me personally. I, I can't speak for everyone. Of course, here in Britain, we know Iceland for several things. Um, and I'm sure you might be aware that, you know, you say Iceland in Britain and people say, you know, what, what's their, what, what's their, um, um, what, what's their, uh, sale you know what 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 they what, what's what the on special prices, offer today you know, yeah that's what i want to see he's, he, yeah he's heard that one before i think <laughs> yeah it's always funny okay okay <laughs> it is funny but let's put it to one side the other thing we know iceland <laughs> for is that bobby fisher went there to live after he played boris basky in reykjavik in the mm. World Chess Championship, I think this was 72, 73 initially. Oh, anyway, Bobby Fischer from the United States. And it was a real kind of Cold War chess match, wasn't it? Mm. Staged in this neutral country called Iceland, which by then we had heard of because this match in 2016 wasn't the first time you went to war with England or <laughs> any of the British Isles, was it? And, and you won the last one as well. <laughs> Yeah, the, the Cod Wars. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Of course. <laughs> Who can forget? I'll tell you what. For me, that was more humiliating. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So before we went to war mm. with Iceland, there was a 50-mile, um, you know, uh, limit to each person's, each island's 
ocean you know there was 50 miles of the ocean belonged to them and you couldn't fish in their waters they wanted it to be a 200 mile uh exclusion zone for their waters the royal navy said look you you lot having a laugh now stop it mm. <laughs> stop it the joke's over but the Icelanders, Icelanders said, no, no, we mean it. We want 200 miles. We went to war. We sent battleships up there against their fishing <laughs> boats, their fishing trawlers, and they won. Oh. Dear, oh dear, I think we got that one wrong. Yeah, but I mean, let's not forget that that's 200 miles is now the standard for any country. Of so. course. I'm not, I'm yeah. not denying your right to it, oh. but mm. always when I talk about um, it's your cod, mate. It's your cod. We're yeah, the, it was our cod. And we eat a lot of it, actually. I had one <laughs> just yesterday, was it two days ago? <laughs> yeah. But, um, mate, I haven't got a problem with the 200 mile limit. And we've got 200 mile limit, so why shouldn't they have a 200 mile limit? Yeah. But with British or English, particularly jingoism, it's kind of like, look, we make the rules. <laughs> we invented the game of football. So we know if it's a penalty or not. And if we know where who we're supposed to be, the same, we ruled the waves once upon a time. But we forgot, we forgot, didn't we, that the Vikings ruled the waves before we ruled the waves. So, and there is, there is a tradition in Iceland of being a strong nation is really what I'm trying to talk of. You've always punched above your weight. Yeah, and I, and I think that comes from, I mean, obviously, we, we, we didn't gain our independence until 1944. Uh, we were just, a, I mean, basically a Danish colony for, I mean, since, what, 15th century, I think. And and there, I think this punching up all the way, but yes, I think it's true, but I think it, it stems a lot from a sense of this kind of almost inferiority complex of being so small that you need to prove to the world that, you know, just because we are few doesn't mean we are any less than anyone else. And, and I, and I, I think, I, I think that that translates into sports. It can happen. Like before, I mean, I think our biggest moment in team sports before the Euros was probably when we got silver in handball at the Olympics in, in Beijing. You know, and, and that was like this moment. Like you, you remember, every Icelander remembers where they were watching that game. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> and 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 I think maybe these moments become a lot greater for these small nations that have, you know, we don't have a very illustrious history. Like there was just farmers dying of starvation here for one thousand years, <laughs> basically. <laughs> Well, I mean, for Britain, like you said, and, I, and maybe this plays into your mentality is this you used to rule the waves. You were an empire. We invented football. We're coming and playing against Iceland. Well, we should just beat them because that's our right as Englishmen. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, maybe you could probably educate me more on that. But yeah, I think I think you know more than enough. I think, <laughs> you, you know, you, well, you, 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 you heard it from the fans in the stadium. You know, you, you, yeah. you heard that that kind of mentality being 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 played out. It is fascinating, isn't it? How where you live influences how how you think. It's fascinating these things, cultural differences. Of course, you do. You lot do know your music as well as we know from Björk and the Sugar Cubes. Now that I've got that right, um, can you can you say can you say her name again? I've never heard Björk. it said properly. Björk. 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 Yeah. Björk. Yeah. Björk. You got you got to roll your R's. Oh, Bjork. Yeah. Bjork. 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 Yeah. Um, well, I used to see her every week um, outside the window of my offices on in Hoxton Square, number six Hoxton Square, arguing with her then boyfriend, Goldie. I took <laughs> every single time. And it was roadblock outside. There's a, like, there was like, you going right around the corner. She and Goldie would be going all <laughs> hell and leather and the uh, tongs and thongs and whatnot. It was amazing. So I got a first row view of it from above, mm -hmm. as you would. Mm -hmm. And she usually won, basically. <laughs> By the time uh, she was done with Goldie, he, he wanted to vanish mm -hmm. from the face of the earth. But anyway, don't tell him I said that. Um, but you do know your music. And I wonder, as always, with a Brazilian Shirt Name podcast, as well as looking at the iconic match of the day, as we've been talking about uh, Iceland beating England 2-1 in Nice. It's part of the Euros in 2016 on the 27th of June. On that day, or in that week, 
the number one track in the official charts was Drake, One Dance, featuring Wizkid and Kyla. What did you make of the charts yourself, Elias? At, at the time? No, no. Well, at the time, if you want, but on reflection now. Yeah, how Which, old were you then? Uh, in 2016. I'm, I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm born in 88, so I was what, 28, 28. What a lovely age to be. Yeah, was I was great. thinking, good job you worked out the maths on that. Otherwise, I'd be sort of quizzing the education system in Iceland. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's just, it's been a while, you know, uh, and, and it's yeah. been, it, I'm so happy you contacted me because I've gotten to relive all these memories of, of mm. that time and, and that game. And, and they're still very play. fresh, as we can hear. Those memories, you know, are still very close to you. I can hear that. Yeah, That's I mean, it, it, it just kind of comes, you know, washing over when you when you start, like, connecting the dots and rethinking about it. But mm. if you're asking me about music, like, I mean, I I basically mostly listen to 80s stuff, to be honest. I'm a, I'm how, like a how does that happen? I'm not, I'm, yeah, this why? isn't a criticism, but yeah. for someone who was born in 88... You've obviously made a conscious decision to 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 go back and and discover things before your birth. I mean, I think I I, I learned a lot about music from my mother and uh, you know listening to what she liked growing up. But I mean, uh, and then just like it evolves. I mean, I'm a fanatical Smiths fan, for instance. I mean, that's my favorite band of all time. And I mean, I listen to a lot of old UK stuff. You know, uh, New Order. Uh, I like uh, Happy Mondays. Uh, Joy Division, you know, all, a lot from Manchester, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, being a Manchester United fan, that fits. You know. <laughs> yeah, indie music it, as well. It's a, it's a climate thing as well, I think. Maybe. You no, know, Manchester is a is a is a a grey city. And that that was and Matt Busby who made Manchester United. Mm. That was always his his thing. You know, we we represent a grey, cold industrial city, dirty old town. And, yeah, let, yeah, let's put some colour in it. That that was became his mission of, of Manchester mm. United. So th there's obviously some kind of some kind of bond of climates between Manchester and, and Iceland. Probably, uh, but I think also it, it just plays into. Uh, I mean, in regards to other countries, I mean, you are fairly close to us. <laughs> you know, we don't have because we're an island, uh, and people speak English here, and, and access to British music has been very accessible. And like, I mean, uh, so, but yeah, I, I mean, at least for me, like, you know, listening to Morrissey's lyrics from the Smiths, I mean, yes, I can connect to a lot of the dreariness, and mm -hmm. like now today, I can tell you, it's a beautiful spring day. We have. Cloudy and eight degrees Celsius. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's oh, life. I'm going to book my holiday right now. Wow! <laughs> you better tell your missus about that one before you leave Brazil. <laughs> um, you, you know the, and it's a good question, Tim, about how does that happen? Uh, that you're born in the late '80s and you're into '80s music. Well, I was born in the last four months of the '50s. And, and you, you went back to the fifties. Yeah. yeah, went back to the. And I, I, think, I was I was born in sixty five, and I went back to the sixties. So exactly. we've all we've all done it to an extent. It's, I think how it happens is that somebody somewhere or something somewhere connects you first to one song from that era, and you think, "Wow, this song was made even before I was born." But you know, in that in a few years before I was born, a few years after, etc., and. You go and do a little bit of research, even in the days before Google, about the songs around the time you were born, etc. What was going on there? Because you know, you'll want to know. Partly, it informs you a little bit, I think, about your parents and you know which world that they were in, even if they weren't living in the countries where that music might have been popular with. But you start finding out, you know, who was the prime minister around that time, etc. There is a journey for me, at least. It was very much like that. For a lot of people, it's through the prism of football, isn't it, that they they reconnect with the era that they were born in. Um, so none of the music in these charts appears there's, there's, to you. There's not a lot for a kind of Smiths <laughs> yeah, fan, no. is there? Um, <laughs> it, it seems to have been taken over by what you described once, Don, as a kind of global airport lounge artists. Yeah. I mean, when I when I listen to, you know, on occasion, what's like top of the charts on Spotify, it's just like, it doesn't seem to be any melodies to most of modern music. 
It's a lot of people That's just. That's what want. our parents used to say about the yeah, music we yeah, followed. Yeah. You know? yeah. But yeah. I mean, to me, it's just like maybe I'm just because I'm 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 now in, in my mid thirties. It just seems to me a lot of mumbling over synthesizers. Mm -hmm. just, <laughs> How about funny. Adele at number fifteen, though? Adele at number fifteen. In fact, once you leave the top ten, where all the sort of global dance music that Tim mentioned there um, dominates. Once you leave that top ten, the yeah. next ten. I've got more melody, more songs about them, albeit sort of very modern takes on, let's say, yeah. a love song. How about that number 15 there? Send My Love to Your New Lover by Adele. I don't, I don't know it, and I don't know okay. the artist. Okay. No, I, don't, no. I mean, I can tell you, Nick Cave just released an amazing new album, and uh, yeah. Gucci Harvey recently released an amazing album. Kylie's Kylie Minogue's last two albums, fantastic. <laughs> Rosie Murphy's last two albums, amazing. And mm -hmm. I can tell you, I'm going to Primavera in Barcelona next week, and I can't wait. And there, Coldplay, Coldplay, Coldplay. No, it, it, it's you're not interested cool. him for the weekend, number thirty. No, I'm not. No, no. Not? I, I, I doubt you will find much on that <laughs> that I enjoy. No, I don't think they will find a single one um, that you enjoy. Not that you enjoy, but one. I'm trying to find one. Well, that no, you... I, hasn't Scan? I, I don't know anything about this, this, but hasn't Scandinavia started producing DJs? It has, yeah. Hasn't it? Producing. Elias? The, uh, DJs, you know, aren't DJs coming through as superstars in Scandinavia as well? Uh, I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I don't, I, I mean, I don't, since I left Copenhagen, I don't really follow what happens in Scandinavia that much, to be honest. Right. Okay. We, so we're not a Scandinavian country. You know, you're, you're no longer colonized. Yeah. You're no longer a Oh, good. Yeah. Good. They're not Scandinavian. Good point. Good point. I yeah. remember <laughs> saying uh, to a Hungarian once, yeah, Eastern Europe, and getting very, very angry with me. We're central. Yeah. We're not, we're not Eastern. You know, these, yeah. these, uh, but, tread with care. But if you're well, thinking about, you know, new music, you know, we got some charts. Like I said, Rose and Murphy's latest album, and I'll be seeing her next week. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Like, she is Rose and Murphy. She used, used to be in Morocco. Regine, uh -huh. Regine Murphy. Regine, yeah. yeah. An Irish, Irish name. Yeah. yeah. She's, she's fantastic. Like, yeah. really, As people who come from a, a small country, and yeah. everyone seems to speak immaculate English, yeah. is travel a necessary part of the Icelandic experience. Oh, for, for sure. Like when you live on this rock in the North Atlantic where the weather is always terrible and there are very few people, you need to leave the country. Like I, I, I think to, to maintain the, 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 your sanity and the health of your soul, you should leave Iceland twice a year, at least mm -hmm. to go and see something else. So yes, I mean, it's just, it's, it's necessary. It, because it can get very dreary here, you know. And and obviously one of the one of the big things that happen when you travel is that you see your own country through new eyes. Yeah. As a result as a result of the comparison. And after all of your experiences traveling, including to Nice for this game in twenty sixteen, <laughs> do you have a clear view on, on what you think are the, the good points and, and the bad points about, about the land of your birth? I, I think so, but I don't think it's because of travel. I mean, I lived abroad for nine years. You know, when I was 19, I moved, when I finished, uh, I don't know, high school, what you call it, uh, I moved to Denmark and then I lived in Berlin for a while. And I think, yes, when you get a perspective, you, I, but I think you need to live in another society to truly mm. yeah. appreciate the good points and be, and get like a, a well-rounded criticism of the bad points of your country. So I, 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 I believe, and I, and I think, and I always advise all young Icelanders, like, move abroad, at least for a year or two, just, just to get that perspective, you know, learn about a new culture, you know, even though it's like, Dan, Dan, it's not like Danes is like, it's, it's not the opposite side of the world or anything, mm -hmm. but there are these nuances to culture, cultural differences, you know, mm -hmm. between countries, even though they're close to each other. And can you say, <laughs> Uh, very good well done flipping egg you can do it please your actual Dane or Scandinavian in Denmark yeah because yeah. if you're going to Denmark that's the one thing you've got to and they love it the way that we say it. when we say um, yeah well done you did it you did it really well it's an absolute pleasure can we do this again yes can we talk about Iceland on another well we just need Iceland to win another game I think are we going to have a long wait yeah. 
I mean, you, you could you could talk about the, the 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 second most talked about game in Icelandic history, which was the time we lost fourteen two to Denmark. In... Oh, we've got to do that. Oh, we've got to do that. We've got to do that. We've got to... No, we got a uh, whole shoften on that one. Yeah, let's whole shoften for now. Whole shoften. Oh, but they say whole keften. I think they say whole keften in right. in Denmark, not yeah. whole shoften. But either way, we've got to do that one. And um, you know, <laughs> let's leave it. We'll leave it on a cliffhanger yeah. till then. Mate, it's been an absolute pleasure having you join yeah. us for this uh, time around for the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast. Elias uh, Torsen is our guest, Icelandic journalist, and was in the stadium on the day that Iceland beat England on the 27th of June 2016. I wasn't there, Tim wasn't there, and he's still smiling, we're still grimacing, uh, but let's call it a draw. Should we just call it a draw, yeah? <laughs> no, 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 no it's like you're out of two. Let's not call it a draw, <laughs> not at all. But, you're, you're trying to you're trying to rob him of the best day of his life. Yeah, no, yeah. no, just trying to ch share some grief with but, him. You know. But let's not forget we're playing England uh, on the seventh of June. Mm, yeah. Well, good luck on that one. Um, are you going to be there in Germany? No, no, no. I'll be in Barcelona. In Barcelona, yeah, yeah. But, so that's that's us going to win then, because Elias yeah. isn't going to be there, Tim. That's right. So, he's, he's, he's their secret weapon. We've established yeah, that. I know. You're, yeah, you're welcome, gonna... boys. You're welcome. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you're still happy because you still got that one day. You're going to have to dine on that for some time, mm. mate. Oh, I'll, I'll be talking about the England game in the nursing home. Like, don't worry. About that. <laughs> <laughs> Not in our nursing home. <laughs> We'd have long forgotten that one, mate. Mm. Uh, no, actually, it's an absolute pleasure. Yeah, well done, you lot. Thanks very much. Thank you.